Lady Susan, Section 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lady Susan by Jane Austen. Section 4. Miss Vernon. Read by Kara Schallenberg. Lady Susan. Read by Kristen Hughes. Mrs. Vernon. Read by Rachel Ellen. 21. Miss Vernon to Mr. De Courcy. Sir, I hope you will excuse this liberty. I am forced upon it by the greatest distress, or I should be ashamed to trouble you. I am very miserable about Sir James Martin, and have no other way in the world of helping myself but by writing to you, for I am forbidden even speaking to my uncle and aunt on the subject, and, this being the case, I am afraid my applying to you will appear no better than equivocation, and as if I attended to the letter, and not the spirit, of mamma's commands. But if you do not take my part and persuade her to break it off, I shall be half distracted, for I cannot bear him. No human being but you could have any chance of prevailing with her. If you will, therefore, have the unspeakably great kindness of taking my part with her, and persuading her to send Sir James away, I shall be more obliged to you than it is possible for me to express. I always disliked him from the first. It is not a sudden fancy, I assure you, sir. I always thought him silly and impertinent and disagreeable. And now he has grown worse than ever. I would rather work for my bread than marry him. I do not know how to apologize enough for this letter. I know it is taking so great a liberty. I am aware how dreadfully angry it will make mamma, but I remember the risk. I am, sir, your most humble servant. F. S. V. 22. Lady Susan to Mrs. Johnson, Churchill. This is insufferable. My dearest friend, I was never so enraged before, and must relieve myself by writing to you, who I know will enter into all my feelings. Who should come on Tuesday but Sir James Martin? Guess my astonishment and vexation, for as you well know I never wished him to be seen at Churchill. What a pity that you should not have known his intentions! Not content with coming, he actually invited himself to remain here a few days. I could have poisoned him. I made the best of it, however, and told my story with great success to Mrs. Vernon, who, whatever might be her real sentiments, said nothing in opposition to mine. I made a point also of Frederica's behaving civilly to Sir James, and gave her to understand that I was absolutely determined on her marrying him. She said something of her misery, but that was all. I have for some time been more particularly resolved on the match, from seeing the rapid increase of her affection for Reginald, and from not feeling secure that a knowledge of such affection might not in the end awaken a return. Contemptible as a regard founded only on compassion must make them both in my eyes, I felt by no means assured that such might not be the consequence. It is true that Reginald has not in any degree grown cool towards me, but yet he has lately mentioned Frederica spontaneously and unnecessarily, and once said something in praise of her person. He was all astonishment at the appearance of my visitor, and at first observed Sir James with an attention which I was pleased to see not unmixed with jealousy. But unluckily, it was impossible for me really to torment him, as Sir James, though extremely gallant to me, very soon made the whole party understand that his heart was devoted to my daughter. I had no great difficulty in convincing de Courcy, when we were alone, that I was perfectly justified, all things considered, in desiring the match and the whole business seemed most comfortably arranged. They could none of them help perceiving that Sir James was no Solomon, but I had positively forbidden Frederica complaining to Charles Vernon or his wife, and they had therefore no pretense for interference. 
though my impertinent sister, I believe, wanted only opportunity for doing so. Everything, however, was going on calmly and quietly, and though I counted the hours of Sir James's stay, my mind was entirely satisfied with the posture of affairs. Guess, then, what I must feel at the sudden disturbance of all my schemes, and that, too, from a quarter where I had least reason to expect it. Reginald came this morning into my dressing-room, with a very unusual solemnity of countenance, and after some preface informed me in so many words that he wished to reason with me on the impropriety and unkindness of allowing Sir James Martin to address my daughter contrary to her inclinations. I was all amazement. When I found that he was not to be laughed out of his design, I calmly begged an explanation, and desired to know by what he was impelled, and by whom commissioned, to reprimand me. He then told me, mixing in his speech a few insolent compliments, and ill-timed expressions of tenderness, to which I listened with perfect indifference, that my daughter had acquainted him with some circumstances concerning herself, Sir James, and me, which had given him great uneasiness. In short, I found that she had in the first place actually written to him to request his interference, and that on receiving her letter he had conversed with her on the subject of it, in order to understand the particulars, and to assure himself of her real wishes. I have not a doubt but that the girl took this opportunity of making downright love to him. I am convinced of it by the manner in which he spoke of her. Much good may such love do him. I shall ever despise the man who can be gratified by the passion which he never wished to inspire, nor solicited the avowal of. I shall always detest them both. He can have no true regard for me, or he would not have listened to her. And she, with her little rebellious heart and indelicate feelings, to throw herself into the protection of a young man with whom she has scarcely ever exchanged two words before. I am equally confounded at her impudence and his credulity. How dare he believe what she told him in my disfavour? Ought he not to have felt assured that I must have unanswerable motives for all that I had done? Where was his reliance on my sense and goodness then? Where the resentment which true love would have dictated against the person defaming me? That person, too, a chit, a child, without talent or education, whom he had been always taught to despise. I was calm for some time, but the greatest degree of forbearance may be overcome, and I hope I was afterwards sufficiently keen. He endeavoured, long endeavoured, to soften my resentment. But that woman is a fool indeed, who, while insulted by accusation, can be worked on by compliments. At length he left me, as deeply provoked as myself and he showed his anger more. I was quite cool, but he gave way to the most violent indignation. I may therefore expect it will the sooner subside, and perhaps his may be vanished for ever, while mine will be found still fresh and implacable. He is now shut up in his apartment, whither I heard him go on leaving mine. How unpleasant, one would think, must be his reflections! but some people's feelings are incomprehensible. I have not yet tranquillized myself enough to see Frederica. She shall not soon forget the occurrence of this day. She shall find that she has poured forth her tender tale of love in vain, and exposed herself for ever to the contempt of the whole world, and the severest resentment of her injured mother. Your affectionate S. Vernon Twenty three. Mrs. Vernon to Lady de Courcy. Churchill. Let me congratulate you, my dearest mother. The affair which has given us so much anxiety is drawing to a happy conclusion. Our prospect is most delightful, and since matters have now taken so favourable a turn, I am quite sorry that I ever imparted my apprehensions to you, for the pleasure of learning that the danger is over is perhaps dearly purchased by all that you have previously suffered. 
I am so much agitated by delight that I can scarcely hold a pen, but I am determined to send you a few short lines by James, that you may have some explanation of what must so greatly astonish you, as that Reginald should be returning to Parklands. I was sitting about half an hour ago with Sir James in the breakfast parlour, when my brother called me out of the room. I instantly saw that something was the matter. His complexion was raised, and he spoke with great emotion. You know his eager manner, my dear mother, when his mind is interested. Catherine, said he, I am going home to-day. I am sorry to leave you, but I must go. It is a great while since I have seen my father and mother. I am going to send James forward with my hunters immediately. If you have any letter, therefore, he can take it. I shall not be at home myself till Wednesday or Thursday, as I shall go through London, where I have business. But before I leave you— he continued, speaking in a lower tone and with still greater energy. I must warn you of one thing. Do not let Frederica Vernon be made unhappy by that Martin. He wants to marry her. Her mother promotes the match, but she cannot endure the idea of it. Be assured that I speak from the fullest conviction of truth of what I say. I know that Frederica is made wretched by Sir James's continuing here. She is a sweet girl, and deserves a better fate— send him away immediately. He is only a fool, but what her mother can mean heaven only knows. Good-bye, he added, shaking my hand with earnestness. I do not know when you will see me again, but remember what I tell you of Frederica. You must make it your business to see justice done her. She is an amiable girl, and has a very superior mind to what we have given her credit for. He then left me, and ran upstairs. I would not try to stop him, for I know what his feelings must be. The nature of mine, as I listened to him, I need not attempt to describe. For a minute or two I remained in the same spot, overpowered by wonder of a most agreeable sort indeed, yet it required some consideration to be tranquilly happy. In about ten minutes after my return to the parlour, Lady Susan entered the room. I concluded, of course, that she and Reginald had been quarrelling and looked with anxious curiosity for a confirmation of my belief in her face. Mistress of deceit, however, she appeared perfectly unconcerned, and after chatting on indifferent subjects for a short time, she said to me, "'I find from Wilson that we are going to lose Mr. de Courcy. Is it true that he leaves Churchill this morning?' I replied that it was. "'He told us nothing of all this last night,' said she, laughing, or even this morning at breakfast, but perhaps he did not know it himself. Young men are often hasty in their resolutions, and not more sudden in forming than unsteady in keeping them. I should not be surprised if he were to change his mind at last, and not go. She soon afterwards left the room. I trust, however, my dear mother, that we have no reason to fear an alteration of his present plan. Things have gone too far. They must have quarrelled, and about Frederica, too. Her calmness astonishes me. What delight will be yours in seeing him again, in seeing him still worthy your esteem, still capable of forming your happiness! When I next write I shall be able to tell you that Sir James is gone, Lady Susan vanquished, and Frederica at peace. We have much to do, but it shall be done. I am all impatience to hear how this astonishing change was effected. I finish as I began, with the warmest congratulations." Yours ever, etc. Cath Vernon 24. From the same to the same. Churchill Little did I imagine, my dear mother, when I sent off my last letter, that the delightful perturbation of spirits I was then in would undergo so speedy, so melancholy a reverse. I never can sufficiently regret that I wrote to you at all, yet who could have foreseen what has happened? My dear mother, every hope which made me so happy only two hours ago has vanished. The quarrel between Lady Susan and Reginald is made up, and we are all as we were before. One point only is gained. Sir James Martin is dismissed. What are we now to look forward to? I am indeed disappointed. Reginald was all but gone, his horse was ordered and all but brought to the door. Who would not have felt safe? For half an hour I was in momentary expectation of his departure. After I had sent off my letter to you, I went to Mr. Vernon, and sat with him in his room, talking over the whole matter, and then determined to look for Frederica, whom I had not seen since breakfast. 
I met her on the stairs and saw that she was crying. "'My dear aunt,' said she, "'he is going. Mr. de Courcy is going, and it is all my fault. I am afraid he will be very angry with me, but indeed I had no idea it would end so.' "'My love,' I replied, "'do not think it necessary to apologize to me on that account. I shall feel myself under an obligation to any one who is the means of sending my brother home, because—' recollecting myself, I know my father wants very much to see him. But what is it you have done to occasion all this? She blushed deeply as she answered, I was so unhappy about Sir James that I could not help. I have done something very wrong. I know, but you have not an idea of the misery I have been in, and mamma had ordered me never to speak to you or my uncle about it, and— "'You therefore spoke to my brother to engage his interference,' said I, to save her the explanation. "'No, but I wrote to him. I did indeed. I got up this morning before it was light, and was two hours about it, and when my letter was done I thought I never should have the courage to give it. After breakfast, however, as I was going to my room, I met him in the passage, and then, as I knew that everything must depend on that moment, I forced myself to give it. He was so good as to take it immediately.' I dared not look at him, and ran away directly. I was in such a fright I could hardly breathe. My dear aunt, you do not know how miserable I have been. Frederica, said I, you ought to have told me all your distresses. You would have found in me a friend, always ready to assist you. Do you think that your uncle or I should not have espoused your cause as warmly as my brother? Indeed, I did not doubt your kindness, said she colouring again, but I thought Mr. de Courcy could do anything with my mother, but I was mistaken. They have had a dreadful quarrel about it, and he is going away. Mamma will never forgive me, and I shall be worse off than ever. No, you shall not, I replied. In such a point as this your mother's prohibition ought not to have prevented your speaking to me on the subject. She has no right to make you unhappy, and she shall not do it. Your applying, however, to Reginald can be productive only of good to all parties. I believe it is best as it is. Depend upon it that you shall not be made unhappy any longer. At that moment, how great was my astonishment at seeing Reginald come out of Lady Susan's dressing-room! My heart misgave me instantly. His confusion at seeing me was very evident. Frederica immediately disappeared. "'Are you going?' I said. "'You will find Mr. Vernon in his own room.' "'No, Catherine,' he replied. "'I am not going. "'Will you let me speak to you a moment?' "'We went into my room. "'I find,' he continued, "'his confusion increasing as he spoke, "'that I have been acting with my usual foolish impetuosity. "'I have entirely misunderstood Lady Susan, "'and was on the point of leaving the house "'under a false impression of her conduct. "'There has been some very great mistake.' We have all been mistaken, I fancy. Frederica does not know her mother. Lady Susan means nothing but her good, but she will not make a friend of her. Lady Susan does not always know, therefore, what will make her daughter happy. Besides, I could have no right to interfere. Miss Vernon was mistaken in applying to me. In short, Catherine, everything has gone wrong, but it is now all happily settled." "'Lady Susan, I believe, wishes to speak to you about it, if you are at leisure.' "'Certainly,' I replied, deeply sighing at the recital of so lame a story. I made no comments, however, for words would have been vain. Reginald was glad to get away, and I went to Lady Susan, curious, indeed, to hear her account of it. "'Did I not tell you,' said she, with a smile, "'that your brother would not leave us after all?' "'You did indeed,' replied I, very gravely, "'but I flattered myself you would be mistaken.' "'I should not have hazarded such an opinion,' returned she, "'if it had not at that moment occurred to me "'that his resolution of going might be occasioned "'by a conversation in which we had been this morning engaged, "'and which had ended very much to his dissatisfaction, "'from our not rightly understanding each other's meaning.' This idea struck me at the moment, and I instantly determined that an accidental dispute, in which I might probably be as much to blame as himself, should not deprive you of your brother. If you remember, I left the room almost immediately. I was resolved to lose no time in clearing up those mistakes as far as I could. The case was this. 
Frederica has set herself violently against marrying Sir James. "'And can your ladyship wonder that she should?' cried I with some warmth. "'Frederica has an excellent understanding, and Sir James has none.' "'I am at least very far from regretting it, my dear sister,' said she. "'On the contrary, I am grateful for so favourable a sign of my daughter's sense. Sir James is certainly below par. His boyish manners make him appear worse, and had Frederica possessed the penetration and the abilities which I could have wished in my daughter, or had I even known her to possess as much as she does, I should not have been anxious for the match.' "'It is odd that you should alone be ignorant of your daughter's sense. "'Frederica never does justice to herself. "'Her manners are shy and childish, and besides, she is afraid of me. "'During her poor father's life she was a spoilt child. "'The severity which it has since been necessary for me to show has alienated her affection. "'Neither has she any of that brilliancy of intellect, "'that genius or vigour of mind which will force itself forward.' say, rather, that she has been unfortunate in her education. Heaven knows, my dearest Mrs. Vernon, how fully I am aware of that, but I would wish to forget every circumstance that might throw blame on the memory of one whose name is sacred with me. Here she pretended to cry. I was out of patience with her. But what, said I, was your ladyship going to tell me about your disagreement with my brother? It originated in an action of my daughter's, which equally marks her want of judgment, and the unfortunate dread of me I have been mentioning. She wrote to Mr. de Courcy. I know she did. You had forbidden her speaking to Mr. Vernon or to me on the cause of her distress. What could she do, therefore, but apply to her brother? "'Good God!' she exclaimed. "'What an opinion you must have of me!' Can you possibly suppose that I was aware of her unhappiness, that it was my object to make my own child miserable, and that I had forbidden her speaking to you on the subject from a fear of your interrupting the diabolical scheme? Do you think me destitute of every honest, every natural feeling? Am I capable of consigning her to everlasting misery whose welfare it is my first earthly duty to promote? The idea is horrible. What? then was your intention when you insisted on her silence. Of what use, my dear sister, could be any application to you, however the affair might stand? Why should I subject you to entreaties which I refuse to attend to myself? Neither for your sake, nor for hers, nor for my own, could such a thing be desirable. When my own resolution was taken I could not wish for the interference, however friendly, of another person. I was mistaken, it is true, but I believed myself right. But what was this mistake to which your ladyship so often alludes? From whence arose so astonishing a misconception of your daughter's feelings? Did you not know that she disliked Sir James? I knew that he was not absolutely the man she would have chosen, but I was persuaded that her objections to him did not arise from any perception of his deficiency. "'You must not question me, however, my dear sister, too minutely on this point,' continued she, taking me affectionately by the hand. "'I honestly own that there is something to conceal. Frederica makes me very unhappy. Her applying to Mr. de Courcy hurt me particularly.' "'What is it you mean to infer,' said I, "'by this appearance of mystery? If you think your daughter at all attached to Reginald, her objecting to Sir James could not less deserve to be attended to than if the cause of her objecting had been a consciousness of his folly. And why should your ladyship, at any rate, quarrel with my brother for an interference which, you must know, it is not in his nature to refuse when urged in such a manner? His disposition, you know, is warm, and he came to expostulate with me. His compassion all alive for this ill-used girl, this heroine in distress. We misunderstood each other. He believed me more to blame than I really was. I considered his interference less excusable than I now find it. I have a real regard for him, and was beyond expression mortified to find it, as I thought, so ill-bestowed. We were both warm, and of course both to blame. His resolution of leaving Churchill is consistent with his general eagerness. When I understood his intention, however, and at the same time began to think that we had been perhaps equally mistaken in each other's meaning, I resolved to have an explanation before it was too late. 
For any member of your family I must always feel a degree of affection, and I own it would have sensibly hurt me if my acquaintance with Mr. de Courcy had ended so gloomily. I have now only to say further that as I am convinced of Frederica's having a reasonable dislike of Sir James, I shall instantly inform him that he must give up all hope of her. I reproach myself for having even, though innocently, made her unhappy on that score. She shall have all the retribution in my power to make. If she value her own happiness as much as I do, if she judge wisely, and command herself as she ought, she may now be easy. Excuse me, my dearest sister, for thus trespassing on your time, but I owe it to my own character, and after this explanation I trust I am in no danger of sinking in your opinion. I could have said, not much indeed, but I left her almost in silence. It was the greatest stretch of forbearance I could practice. I could not have stopped myself had I begun. Her assurance! Her deceit! But I will not allow myself to dwell on them. They will strike you sufficiently. My heart sickens within me. As soon as I was tolerably composed I returned to the parlour. Sir James's carriage was at the door, and he, merry as usual, soon afterwards took his leave. How easily does her ladyship encourage or dismiss a lover! In spite of this release, Frederica still looks unhappy, still fearful, perhaps, of her mother's anger, and though dreading my brother's departure, jealous, it may be, of his staying. I see how closely she observes him and Lady Susan, poor girl. I have now no hope for her. There is not a chance of her affection being returned. He thinks very differently of her from what he used to do. He does her some justice, but his reconciliation with her mother precludes every dearer hope. Prepare, my dear mother, for the worst. The probability of their marrying is surely heightened. He is more securely hers than ever. When that wretched event takes place, Frederica must belong wholly to us. I am thankful that my last letter will precede this by so little, as every moment that you can be saved from feeling a joy which leads only to disappointment is of consequence. Yours ever, etc. Catherine Vernon End of Section 4 Lady Susan by Jane Austen